Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Paul Sweeney. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Let's get right to it. Let me give you the history. Paul's going to bring him in. Matt Lozzetti with Deutsche Bank and the team over there absolutely nailed a graceful recession call years ago that came out and they said, you know, there's going to be a recession off the pandemic. But the first day they said it, Paul, they said, we don't know when. <laughs> and they had a huge humility at the time, yep. trying not to cherry pick the gloom of recession. And so there we are. It really hasn't happened. It hasn't all happened. that stimulus and... You know, an update here as we go into all this labor data. Why don't you bring in Mr. Lozetti? Exactly. The economic data has been solid. Inflation coming down. It's, uh, you know, the question is, is it a soft landing? Matt Lozetti joins us. He's the chief U.S. economist for Deutsche Bank. The last time I saw him, Tom, was in the Vail Airport. And I said, hey, how was your skiing? He didn't ski. He was out there for business. Oh, yeah. Who does that? Oh, yeah. That's I mean, it's just, That's immediately I, I took my I, I vote away from him, you know. you know. So, Matt, thanks so much for joining us here. As Tom was saying here, this economy... I guess, what do you guys make of it, the Deutsche Bank? I think most people, the marketplace broadly defined, is pleasantly surprised about the U.S. economy, particularly relative to other parts of the world. You have to be pleasantly surprised. I think if you look back to 2023, it was the best possible outcome for the economy, the best possible outcome from the Fed's perspective. You had above 3% real GDP growth. You had the unemployment rate down to 3.7%. And over the back half of last year, you had core PC inflation, which is what the Fed focuses on, below 2%. Um, That was a remarkable outcome, I think, for a Fed that raised rates by over 500 basis points that was undertaking a very aggressive QT outcome. Question is, you know, where do we go from here? Um, We still now continue to see this very resilient economy continuing. The labor market looking resilient. We'll get an update with with data this week. Key question will be, especially from the Fed's perspective, how much of the disinflation trend that we got last year continues? Uh, or is the strong inflation prints that we got over January and February, right, yeah. is that a new trend that we're, that we're seeing? That, how the, how the do you Fed's guys think about that? Because that's probably one of the forefront issues for the market is, boy, the, are we seeing a resurgence in inflation? What do you guys think? Yeah, so you have to acknowledge, I think January was a very strong inflation print. And when yep. we got data last week, core PC was actually revised a little bit higher. Yep. February was better, but not good enough from the Fed's perspective. I think when you look at the components that drove it, uh, shelter inflation, uh, both in January and February was higher than anticipated. You know, we do continue to expect that that will come down. We have these private sector estimates of rents that have come down a lot. So I, I think that's still mm-hmm. going to happen, but it's more uncertain than it was three months ago. Uh, and, you know, when you look at these other core services items, there was actually a lot of disinflation in them in the February data. I thought that was a good data point from the Fed's perspective right. in terms of super core. The morning after the invasion of Ukraine by Mr. Putin, David Folkert's Landau of Deutsche Bank was adamant that we would see government stimulus, we would see fiscal policy across Europe and across the world. Clearly, we've seen that in the United States. Are we, is this great underestimation of our boom economy? Is it just because of the three stimuli we had? No, I, I think it is absolutely part of it. If you look at the budget deficit last year relative to the unemployment rate, we were running a very loose fiscal policy relative to the stance of the economy. But that's not the only thing. I think we've seen greater focus on the supply side of the economy, especially from the Fed. And there's great work from Brookings, um, the CBO recently, just looking at uh, net immigration flows, how much that added to labor, the labor market over the past year, and was this really positive supply side story for the economy. I think it allowed us to have strong growth, but disinflation as part of that. And then you just have to say that the Fed's monetary policy tightening was probably just had less traction than anticipated. You know, Markets didn't crumble as much as I would have thought under a 5% Fed funds rate. Uh, people were able to lock in low interest rates, so mortgage debt ratios are, are still quite low. So where's your real and nominal GDP run rate right now? You know, going on three, four quarters. So, so I think if you look at what I think potential growth is for the economy, at, at least in the near term, um, I think it's probably closer to two and a quarter or so. Um, I think it's meaningfully above what the Fed has real in their GDP, own forecast. Real GDP, potential Real GDP, potential. Right, right. Now, I think that there's, there's obviously lots of uncertainty around that. Um, the labor supply story has been really important there. 
But I think there's a really constructive productivity growth story for the US economy if you look over the next right. several years. Now, part of that could certainly be AI. Um, we as a house are very constructive on AI, but I think there's a lot of uncertainty in quantifying that. The reason to be positive is that you typically see tight labor markets followed by very strong productivity growth. And the idea is that firms are forced to do capital deepening, do CapEx, find productivity enhancing yeah, that's projects. Paul, we call yep. that the yep. Boston Red Sox. Right. Exactly. It's forced to find productivity. So Matt, given that backdrop, Matt, what's our Federal Reserve gonna do? I mean, I, I don't know. We started the year thinking six rate <clears throat> cuts and now we're pricing less than, I don't know, three, maybe a little bit less than three. How do you guys think about that? Yeah, so we have them cutting first in, in June. Okay. Um, I think what we've heard almost uniformly from Fed officials right. is that they're not in a rush today. And they're not in a rush today, both because the economy is hanging in better than anticipated, yep. and so there's no urgency right. to cut, but also because inflation has surprised the upside. So there's greater uncertainty about the disinflation trend. I think if you get softer inflation prints over the next few months, the Fed probably does cut in June. But I think the, the bigger question will be, what does this overall cutting profile look like? And I think there's a very strong case to be made that perhaps the Fed only does two or three insurance cuts. We think of it as a little bit more of a mid-cycle adjustment and that any cuts beyond that become right. a lot more uncertain. This is a great half hour. I got Matt Lazzetti with us at the Deutsche Bank and then Edward Morse will join us, Emeritus Citigroup with his new effort in looking at geopolitics and oil. I want to link the two together. Deutsche Bank, 15, 20 years ago, owned the high ground on oil analysis. It was Adam Siminski and Paul Sankey. Nobody worldwide, everybody read it. Everybody read the Deutsche Bank Excel spreadsheets on supply and demand. What does $90 Brent crude mean to you? How does that change the American calculus of oil? To be honest, I don't think it, it changes it all that much. You know, I, I think as we think about um, you know, oil from a growth perspective, at least from a downside risk perspective, it's usually oil price shocks that drives that. And so you right. need to, to break out of what a recent range has been. $90 is still within the recent range over the past, past several years. The economy is, is very different than it was you know, 10 yeah, years ago. It. Okay. Um, so it's not just about how it impacts the U.S. consumer and disposable income, but you do have shale, you have net exports. Well, but you, you, you model out, like J.P. Morgan, do you model out that if you get an emerging market boom, you get oil well over 100, even out to 110, 120? Sure, I, you know, I think it's, it's certainly possible that you get there. What drives that is really important for the economy. So if it is a supply side driven story, then that acts as yeah. a shock that's more negative for growth. If it is organically driven by stronger demand, you know, okay. certainly that, that can weigh on US consumers, but overall it's a less negative story for growth. I got 20 seconds. Is it true Villanova's looking at you to salvage the basketball program? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. Okay, Matt was Eddie, <laughs> thank you uh, so much. Out of Villanova, you. UCLA there uh, with Deutsche Bank. And yes, Edward Morse coming up in a, a moment. Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney worldwide right now with Edward Morris, definitive at Citigroup for years. They threw him up. Jane called him up. He went down to his office and said, Ed, see ya. <laughs> well, that's not quite what happened. He's iconic in oil and, uh, of course, with a geopolitical study to it, his work with the Council on Foreign Relations. And, you know, I'm like, OK, he can't retire. Where's he going to land? Yeah. And what's so cool about Hard Tree he wants, is this is think. Amarada Hess from a million years ago. And then Oak Tree Management took out Amarada's interest. So there's a heritage here of global oil, along with the intellectual acuity of Oak Tree. And they've picked up Ed Morse because he was looking for a job. We're honored that Dr. Morse joins us uh, this morning. Where, Ed Morse, congratulations on this new effort. I'm glad to see you're, you've slowed down to a 60-hour week. Ed, where's the marginal geopolitical interest right now? Which region, which country, which part of Brent crude is the most interest to Edward Morse? Well, I think it really is the Middle East, and it's the Middle East for obvious reasons, uh, not just because of uh, what's happening in, uh, in Israel, but the aftermath of all of that and struggles internally and externally involving Iran and Iraq. Uh, and of course, we've got uh, Saudi Arabia, which is, along with Russia, leading the charge with OPEC+. Plus. So if you look at the politics of managing markets and the risks to the management of markets, the Middle East is the main focus. But, you know, honestly, if you're trading in the Western Hemisphere uh, and you're trading around Houston, 
and you look at uh, a new Mexican refinery right. that's likely to open, you know, the, the sweet sour relationship with the U.S. Gulf Coast is also changing. So it depends on where you are. Yeah. But globally, it's really the Middle East. You know, I was talking to Jane and I said, why'd you let him go? I mean, he had the call of the pandemic. Everybody else, Paul, was looking for $120 barrel oil. And Morse is up on the soapbox screaming, no, you're wrong. <laughs> We're going down to 60 or 70, whatever it was. A massive call as well. Do you see Ed pushing against that? a nascent global demand that gets us to this Brent crude 90 or higher? Well, I don't think it's the demand side, uh, Tom. I think it's really the supply side. I think it's a combination of factors on the supply side. That combination of factors is the restraint that uh, major producers are having and putting crude oil into the market uh, and the distortions in the market that need to be worked out and they will be worked out that come from the blockages of the Suez Canal uh, and leading, you know, Sumed pipeline is the only way to really get sustainable flows uh, into the Med and out of the Med from the Middle East and to the Middle East. So uh, we're going to have, as we did with Russia, Ukraine, a working out of freight rates, a working out of that distortion, weighing on prices eventually. You need, uh, and what we don't really know uh, is what the response is going to be uh, on the uh, demand side with respect to buying oil from the Middle East and elsewhere, particularly in China. We've got a country that has shifted its gears as a major importer, shifting its gears in terms of deciding for geopolitical reasons. It's going to be building a massive inventory. It's got, a, we reckon, roughly another 500 million barrels of storage capacity it can be filled. All of storage in China is strategic. And you get to high prices, China is not only not going to be importing more than they consume, they're going to be exporting. That's the pattern that we've learned to anticipate, and we should learn to anticipate it as oil breaches $90, which looks like an almost certainty in the next couple of months. And one of the things that is relatively new in the global oil space is the fact that the U.S. has gone from being a net importer to a net exporter. Why don't our friends down in, I don't know, Texas and Oklahoma just start fracking some more oil? Well, I think that's exactly what's going to happen. You have uh, several new incentives to uh, frack more. One of them is where the price is, where the forward curves are, and where you can make money if you're a publicly traded company by shifting to rapid response uh, petroleum production. And then there's on top of that, the technological advances that are being made, uh, you know, there are lots of talks on your shows and others about the revolutionary impacts of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is also working its way into the oil patch. And that artificial intelligence is bringing up productivity levels in terms of how you manage fracking crews, how you manage frack uh, uh, production or fr frack utilization. Uh, and I think we're going to see uh, a response to that. Uh, we had uh, a, a, a basically a worldwide webinar from S&P uh, earlier uh, uh, in a few days ago uh, in which they said, you know, their, their, their deck, deck increase in U.S. production of 800,000 barrels a day may have to be revised upward mm. because of the high prices that we're now seeing. So how about OPEC Plus? What is the role of OPEC Plus now in the global marketplace? Well, OPEC plus is a response to the failure of OPEC. Uh, OPEC, uh, and I have written about this ad nauseum, always wrong, uh, <laughs> that we're seeing the end of OPEC, but uh, the, the survival of OPEC depended upon bringing in Russia and Central Asian countries right. and other non-OPEC members. Uh, so they, you know, they've got a very big hold on the market uh, and, their, and their aim is to maximize revenues. Uh, and not to maximize them too much, uh, where they get a, uh, right. a drop in oil demand. So uh, that's that's its role, and they're going to stall as long as they can to see where prices are going right. before, you know, lifting the and thing. We will see whether they lift it yeah. in June. And I got two two minutes left. Do you drive an electric okay. car? Do you drive an electric I, car or a hybrid? I drive a Tesla. You drive a Tesla. See, I knew see, that. There you go. Ed Morse on electric cars. Is is the bloom off the rose, or do you think there's an immediate sustainability? This say President Biden would want an immediate sustainability. I see it in the United Kingdom. I see it in Europe. Does Ed Morse think they're here to stay, or is it one off and we go back to high, to uh, in the internal combustion engine? 
I don't think we're going to see a rush back to internal combustion engines. We may see uh, a rush into hybrid vehicles. We've certainly seen public policy in the city that we live in or work in is one where we're seeing delivery vans um, based on fossil fuels and buses based purely on fossil fuels being eliminated. And uh, hybrid vehicles are certainly uh, one way to go. And uh, on electric, it depends on you know which country you're in. China certainly uh, is seeing an end to gasoline demand because of their EV policy. Uh, the U.S. isn't because we're not short distance drivers, we're long distance drivers, and uh, drivers are awaiting uh, technological change to see a longer lasting battery in terms of miles driven. But I can tell you, it is the most fun car I've ever driven, uh, even better than the MGs I used to drive. <laughs> and, there, you oh, there you go. Yeah. And like George, that. I can just see him in the MG TD. Oh, yeah. That was the one Tooling with the around. wooden slats in the bottom. My father wouldn't let me buy it. Ed Morris's father let sure. me buy one. He yep. did. He did better than I did. Ed Morris, wonderful to speak to you. Congratulations on this important position at Hartree. Mr. Morris, on our marginal barrel of oil. With the shock of the Erdogan losses in Turkey in municipal elections, there is exactly, oh, one, two, maybe three experts I'd want to talk to. But the most accessible one for you is my book of the year, The Loom of Time. For 2023, it transfixed me. It is Robert D. Kaplan doing what he's doing. He moves from Morocco over to the various stands to the east. It is a spectacular book. In chapter three, we find Robert D. Kaplan slowly walking around this architecturally complex and monumental structure known as Constantinople. Robert Kaplan, thank you so much for joining us today. Is Erdogan done? Uh, no, first of all, it's a pleasure to be with you, Tom. No, Erdogan is not done. He's not up for re-election for a number of years now. And look at it this way. He's been in power 20 years. Yeah. You don't stay in power for 20 years in a partial or a full democracy without ultimately going downhill. So he's still got some ammunition up his sleeve. And um, I, the big question for Turkey, though, is, look, imagine if Donald Trump had been in power in the United States for 24 years like Erdogan has. What would be the state of institutions, the Justice Department, etc.? Erdogan has destroyed Turkish institutions. So the question for Turkey is, even if there is a new prime minister, a new president right. in a few years, like um, uh, Imamoglu, who won the mayorship of Istanbul the other day in a big victory, even if he becomes prime minister, will there be institutions to work with or will Turkey have a kind of Weimar right. chaotic situation? Out of his childhood and his, you know, the interesting childhood of Erdogan in the 22 years that he's uh, been the leader. His foreign policy has been to look south and take his Islamic view across the Levant, across all of your the loom of time, the arc of the Middle East. Is he diminished in his influence in the Middle East now because of these election yes, losses? Is. Yeah, y yes, he is. You lose this big in a nationwide election, which is what this really was. He not only lost in Istanbul, he lost across the country. This lowers his credibility throughout the region, which was never, you know, which was problematic to begin with, because the major mistake he made a long time ago was to back the radicals in the Middle East, not the conservative Sunni Arab regimes. So it wasn't as if he was pro-Arab and anti-Israel. He was pro-radical Arab. And as a result, he misread the region. All right. Speaking of another region of the world, let's go to Asia. President Biden, President Xi spoke by phone about a number of key issues here. Um, Robert, where, how do you view that part of the world right now and the U.S. role and how the U.S. should act over the coming months and quarters and maybe a year? I think between now and the election and next November, the Biden administration is going to try 
to orchestrate a rapprochement with China, um, because that will look good in elections. You know, you know, lower the talk of conflict. You know, stabilize the relationship. That will look good with voters. And also, the relationship has gotten so toxic, so so dangerous that something has to be done. You know, markets, financial markets have priced in the war in Ukraine. They've priced in Gaza, all of that nicely. But if there were ever a real shooting war between the the two the world's two largest economies in a high-end military conflict, it would be devastating for financial markets, absolutely devastating. Um, and that's if the war only lasted a few days. It could go on longer. So it's imperative of the Biden administration, now I think the Chinese authorities as well, to not to solve their problems, but to build a parameter around them, to build rules of the road so that the so that the downward turn in relations is, is at least stabilized. Robert, again, there's so many ways we could go here. We have limited time. Let's switch gears yet again, go to the Middle East. It appears that Israel is just not backing down what a mess. on any scenario. Just exactly, Tom, I mean, exactly. And it seems like the Biden administration and others are growing a little weary of uh, Israel's position here. Where yeah. are we there? Uh, we, we are we are in a set, essentially a war with Iran that started on October seventh. Okay. The uh, the uh, the October seventh atrocities were so bestial, they were so intimate that I believe it changed the Israeli calculus on how to deal with Iran. And we saw an example of this the other day where they where they killed a number of Iranian generals. Uh, this is going to go on because October 7th, even if the Iranians were not directly implicated, they were fundamentally implicated because they had been supporting Hamas for so many years. So we're in a proxy war with Iran for the moment it's in Gaza. I think this summer it will move right. northward to um, to southern is to northern Israel, southern Lebanon, because, you know, Israel has about 80,000 citizens who cannot return to their homes in northern Israel. That's a de facto loss of sovereignty, which no right. democratic government <clears throat> could ever accept. Permanently. With us, Robert T. Kaplan, his book, The Loom of Time, my book of the year last year. Robert Kaplan, I, I, to continue this discussion, I think, that, and Paul, I don't want to speak for you, I'll speak for myself. On a mic and off mic, I'm getting one theme. If we could just get rid of Mr. Netanyahu. What does Israel look like the morning after Mr. Netanyahu exits? I think the morning after Mr. Netanyahu exits, you will see the same policy more or less applied in Gaza. Uh, you know, a determination to fit to kill off those or to defeat those last six or eight battalions of Hamas in southern Gaza in the Rafah area, uh, the desire to keep pressing militarily to to kill off the Hamas leadership, uh, the desire to again restore sovereignty through in northern Israel through, if necessary, a war with Hezbollah. I think that I think a lot of us have been, you know, are living in a dream world that the policy is going to suddenly shift 45 or 90 degrees in a direction because of the end of Netanyahu. I think the fundamental you know, war ain't policy will continue, though it will take on a much more diplomatic guise. Robert, I guess that one of the many risks in that part of the world is a more direct confrontation between the U.S. and Iran. What's the risk of that? And, and how does the U.S. position itself? Yeah, of course, there's a strong risk. Keep in mind that neither the U.S. nor the Iranians want uh, a major war between each other. And I think the and I, I don't even think the Iranians want a major war directly with Israel. Uh, you know, there will be a lot of tit for tat going on. Remember, the Iranian government is enormously unpopular in its own country. 
One thing you have not seen so far since October 7th is massive pro-Palestinian demonstrations in Iran itself, because they couldn't happen because the population is not where the regime is. And a major war with the United States would only make the regime even that much more unpopular and would risk toppling the regime altogether. Robert Kaplan, thank you for joining us on Short Notice Today's book, Definitive. Can't say enough about the chapter on Turkey, on Constantinople, and Mr. Uh, Erdogan. Now your daily look at the front pages around the world. So, Paul, in College Station, Texas, and this goes back a few years, the Aggies were playing the Center College Praying Colonels sure. in the Dixie Classic in 1922. <laughs> and to make a long story short, a 12th man came out in the field. Really? And saved the That's day. where it... And they like to have a statue that just... One night, Jess Menton was so drunk, she passed out <laughs> near the statue. <laughs> It's it the happens. 12th man statue. It's a right and joining us now, the official 12th man of surveillance, <laughs> Jess Metten, fighting Texas wow. Aggie to help out with the newspapers. Jess, thanks so much for being here. Lisa, what do you have today? <laughs> note okay um we remember we heard about the california law um about fast food workers right increase their minimum pay to 20 40 dollars an hour 20 dollars an hour that's what they're making this is for fast food places with more than 60 locations but now because of this business insider they crunch the numbers they're saying californians could pay a heck of a lot more for their starbucks okay so they did the numbers they said starting april 1st menu items they increase 50 cents to as much as a dollar each by comparing their receipts okay and starbucks did confirm they raised the prices but they didn't say Ah. by how much so they did the math if you go for your normal starbucks and the price increase order is let's say 80 cents multiply that by 260 drinks okay and now you can expect to pay more than 200 dollars more a year for that little daily indulgence of that starbucks drink so is it just 20 bucks an hour at fast foods or does this change the world for mel's diner on sunset boulevard this is fast food workers Oh, okay, yeah, just like workers, but they have to have more than sixty locations. That's why. Jess, Jess, Jess are, you, are, you, are you a Starbucks person? I feel like I'm off and on. It depends. So, on what's, how what's, tired what's I your am. drink when you go to Starbucks? I like a chai latte. Chai latte. Oh, yeah. Ooh. See, there you go, Tom. Well, well, I feel like Tom. Did, <laughs> <laughs> you're not a fan. No, I'm you afraid like the chai to ask. Okay. I, one, one of my offspring, the middle child. The middle child got a special brass card from Starbucks. Oh. She spent so much money there. Yep. I don't know what it got her. <laughs> 20 right. bucks an hour. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm seriously. It's a big economic you're running, issue. You're yeah. running a McDonald's. That's uh, like 20 yeah. people at a time. And what are they going to do? They're going to pass it along to, to consumers. Simple what does that. it do that's to a big number big. two value meal? I mean, all yeah, of a sudden, you're 20 bucks for a burger. I know. That's where we go. Next. It's crazy. Okay. <laughs> NC State's DJ Burns. You know, we love were talking about him. We love him. We love him, right? He's actually getting some NFL interest. <laughs> so what do you switch from guy. basketball? He's six foot nine. He weighs 275 pounds. Wow. Okay, so he's starting he's to catch the that. eye of these basketball fans. <laughs> NFL executives are looking. The question is, could he make the switch from sports at that you? pro level? You know, yeah. succeed on the offensive tackle. He actually talked about it yesterday in an interview. He said he would not rule out exploring a career in basketball and football, but he said he's trying to make NBA the plan. Paul, okay? what do you think? Um, He's. I think. I think he has a future in the NBA, but yeah. nobody really knew him before this big run here. Correct. But if you look at him, he can score down low. Yeah. He can pass really well. They run the offense through this guy, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. So I give him a shot. Okay. I mean, give, but he can on, the obvious thing here is a Shaq compare, right? Yeah. I mean, is he like Shaq? No, 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 he no he's not a Shaq. But, but if, if, I'm, if I'm this guy, why would I want to get my brains beat in on the football field as opposed Thank to you. just playing? Hoops, so we'll see how it goes. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, he's yeah. still in the final four. Yeah, so we all he get is, to watch the state. Yeah, is yeah, Texas yeah. saying I'm in the final four? No. <laughs> no. no, we're still we're still worried about next year's football Giga team. Giga Maggie's <laughs> next. <laughs> Wow. Okay. <laughs> Are neckties making a comeback? This was in the Wall Street Journal. So you see presidents like they increasingly don't wear that. them. Neither do CEOs. You uh, see them when they sit please. down for some interviews. There was a big fundraiser last week. President Joe Biden, Bill yep. Clinton, Barack Obama. They did not wear they neckties. Look, can I okay? editorialize? Please. Sweeney looks out of central casting. <laughs> I mean, the girls, it's like when George Clooney's in the building. The exactly. girls circle the interactive I hear that all the time. Studio. This was a big change. Sweeney, it works. 
If I came in looking like Sweeney, Jess, what do you think? I'd look like a moron. Well, I have to point out, though, Paul Sweeney is like the fashion police here at Bloomberg. Especially on oh, Fridays, yeah, he will call people, people out. out. I think yes. some What's of the shorts and sandals one day, Forget about irate. neck neckties. Are, are sandals allowed in the workplace? That is a hard no for and me. And pajama pants, I think. Okay, but this is why we had Jess in. Sandals or sandals with socks? Michael Dart is wearing wow. sandals with socks. What do you think? Oh, no. I, I, let's go with neither. Let's go. Yeah, let's go with neither. Okay. One more, Lisa. But what, what about the got? bow tie? Where does that come in? That's no, well, I mean, the bow tie is a classic. Only a handful of people can carry that. And obviously let's Tom can pull can. it off. No. See? <laughs> Goodness. Are I don't you like done? this next You're not one. Done. No, one I got one more zinger for you. Okay, couples. They, I, I, I got to be honest, straight out. I'm still reading the article as we get to it right now. But couples, they are trading those restless nights. They're going for dual primary bedrooms because uh, they need each need their own abode for their for personal space it's for snoring. snoring. It's about for snoring, snoring because I have to admit, yes, my husband does snore and sometimes he gets booted to my son's room because yeah. my son's not there right now. So that's so. A snor- I read this. A <laughs> the snore, snore room. room. But I'm not going to outfit a second bedroom and, and have them split. That's not good. Yeah, but not some good. people do that. I know. They're not- making their own his and hers bedrooms. So I was they- just in Versailles. Yeah. When we went to Paris, I think Mrs. Key not to Versailles. It was lovely, but and they gave it, they really it was really uh, lovely. The lines were like, "Are you kidding me?" And they have a snore room at Versailles. Have, yeah, Louis the Sixteenth just couldn't do it, and Marie said, "He built a You're snore." Room. It's like it's like a wing away through the hall of mirrors as well. Jess, let's talk about softball at Texas A and M, crushing Prairie View with a no hitter yesterday. It's like gospel down there, isn't it? It definitely is. And I mean, everybody always wants to think of football. Obviously, we were coming off kind of a challenging season this <laughs> right. past year. Obviously, we don't have anybody okay. in the here's the money. Four. Here's a money question. This is a newspaper <laughs> question with Jess Metten. How come one of the best oceanography schools in the world is in the middle of nowhere in Texas. I mean, it's under the radar, but people should pay more attention, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, Why not? It's out there. Would well, you have any equity wisdom today? You're usually getting she a battle. Of, every, of course. She she every I actually <laughs> just did, I did the technicals on Apple stock. So it's getting Please. close to the intraday low around 165 from October. That's so it's getting close. Yes, exactly. So that's the key support level right there. So a lot of technicians feel like maybe the worst of the pain could potentially be passed after Apple came off of its We're worst quarter. We're support on Tesla to, right now. Oh, actually, Esha Day has a story that just came out watching on that particular stock. So if you, you should go to her bio page for Esha Day. I'm so that breaks it, it down it. and looking well, at that's it. That's how you find print. <laughs> Make or break level in latest yes. wipeout market temptation. See 150 as key right. support, Tom. For 165, Tesla. right? And we're 165 yeah, exactly. for Apple, and then. Right. Yep. Thank yeah. you to your so, people for scheduling you in here. I mean, you, you, you know, she I, I walked by day. and you told me to come in. <laughs> it's, it's great, Jess Benton. Thank you so yeah, much. Be careful when you walk by. I know. With Bloomberg Markets, like really brilliant work. This is off the radar. It is for the terminal, the Bloomberg Professional Service. But it's a whole team of uh, in, in, uh, maniacs like Jess Metten that 24-7 Writing. have a focus on the And on the on weekends, the markets. too. On the weekends, yes, that's too. Yes. Paul, 24-7. Yes, there you that's go. You nailed it. <laughs> For me, okay. yeah, that's like. <laughs> okay, do you think I should take the bow tie off, Lisa? What do no, you, think? you have to keep no. it. That's your trademark. <laughs> okay. You have to. <laughs> okay. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. Bringing you the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.